Hi, this is Paul. Um, before there was Jordan Peterson, there was Mark Driscoll. Well, not really. Jordan Peterson's older than Mark Driscoll. In fact, a little fun tidbit, Mark Driscoll and Rob Bell are only born 49 days apart. 49, that's 7 times 7. Mark Driscoll and Rob Bell both founded mega churches that they named Mars Hill. Mark Driscoll and Rob Bell both were, in some ways, the twin peaks of the emergent movement that followed the seeker movement. But before there was Jordan Peterson, at least on the national stage, there was Mark Driscoll. And while I was on vacation, this piece by David France dropped, and I want to read some of it. Why a Masculine Ministry Rose and Fell, Learning the Lessons of Mark Driscoll's Decline. This is obviously about the rise and fall of Mars Hill podcast. Let me start with a brief story about nearly a nearly lost man and the simple thing that saved him. Three years ago, this is David French writing, and we'll talk a little bit about David French French or France? David French, yeah. Three years ago, I was on the road for work, and I picked up. I was picked up by an airport by a young man who looked like a vet. We had a 90-minute trip to the speaking venue, so we struck up a conversation. I asked him if he served. He said yes. I asked him if he deployed. He said yes, to Afghanistan. I asked how he's fitting in after he came back home. He got quiet for a moment, and he said, have you heard of Jordan Peterson? I said, yes, absolutely. In fact, I just reviewed his book for National Review. The young man says, well, Jordan Peterson saved my life. That won't come as a surprise to anyone who's watched this channel for the last three years. How? The story began the way a lot of veteran stories began. After he came back from the war, he felt lost. He had no purpose. In a flash, he'd gone from an existence where every day mattered and every day had a mission to a world that seemed empty and aimless by comparison. To put it in the words of a cavalry officer I served with in Iraq, I wonder if I've done the most significant thing I'll ever do by the time I'm 25 years old. The young man I was talking to had no mission. He had no mentor. He picked up the bottle so much that he couldn't put it down. Eventually, he had suicidal thoughts. How did Jordan Peterson bring him back? He told him to clean up his room. Yep, clean up his room. He told him to get organized. He told him to stop saying things that aren't true, things that made him weak. It all sounds so simple, so basic. We don't need transcendent truths to turn our lives around. around to turn our lives around? Well, yes. But sometimes the process starts with a direction and with a discipline, especially for young men. The small disciplines led to larger disciplines. Small purpose led to larger purpose. And there was my new friend working hard in a relationship and saving for a down payment on a house. No wonder he was choked up with gratitude. Why bring up this story? Because one of the most remarkable podcasts I've ever heard is by Mark Cosper at Christianity Today, and it chronicles the rise and fall of Mars Hill in Seattle and the corresponding rise and fall of its celebrity pastor, Mark Driscoll. The thing that's remarkable about the podcast is that it spends so much time describing what worked at Mars Hill, why Driscoll and his church became a sensation, um, as it does describing while it failed. And as we get into this podcast, we will start going through some of those things. And we can't start talking about either what worked or what failed without talking about young men like the driver in the story above. Driscoll, you see, was a Jordan Peterson figure before Jordan Peterson. He was a Christian celebrity pastor who understood that many millions of young men were lost. He aimed at ministry straight, he aimed his ministry straight at them, provided them with a unique vision of a boot camp Christian experience. He'd sometimes browbeat the men in his congregation for hours at a time, but then ultimately burned up his credibility in the bonfire of his own arrogance. And as we get into the podcast. We'll examine some of these things as I'm tipping my hand a little bit, but as I do some commenting on the podcast, uh, I, I wonder to the degree that Driscoll aimed his ministry at these young men or simply was one of these young men. And for that reason, Driscoll shared, well, the way he climbed out of his hole with others who needed to climb out of the hole. 
I wonder how much of it was intentional, at least to the degree it seems to be with Jordan Peterson, and how much of it was simply incidental to Mark Driscoll's own story. But we'll get into that as we get into his story, as we get into the podcast. Driscoll resigned from Mars Hill in 2014 under fire for his harsh, domineering leadership, and also a year after Driscoll apologized for mistakes following plagiarism, plagiarism allegations. Mars Hill dissolved shortly after. It's a story worth remembering because young men are still struggling with modern masculinity. The church is still struggling to reach them, and Driscoll's story is one part guide and one part cautionary tale. I use the word guide advisedly with full knowledge of Driscoll's deep flaws, but he did something. He did understand that young men were flailing, flailing and failing. Jordan Peterson's most recent podcast with, I forget the guy's name right now, but the book about boys. Um, Why do churches not do well with this? They're still flailing and failing. Here's how I phrase the predicament in my review of Peterson's book. They're deeply suspicious of organized religion, yet they can't escape the nagging need for transcendence in their lives. They want, to, they want answers to great questions, but they're suspicious of authority. They want purpose, but they don't know what purpose means apart from careerism. Oh, and all the most politically correct are keenly aware that mankind has fallen, that men and women are different. <laughs> And that while the post-Christian West has allegedly killed God, it can't seem to replace him with anything better. This is the landscape of spiraling rates of anxiety and depression, of extended adolescence, of a generation of young men who've been told that masculinity is toxic, but not taught how to live in a way that recognizes or even cares to comprehend their true nature. And you can read the rest of the, rest of the article. And now the conclusion. Let's return to the young vet at the start of this essay. Did Dris- uh, like Driscoll did to young men a decade before, Peterson woke him up. He gave him a sense of immediate purpose. He spoke to a man in the way that so many men understand, directly challenging them to do better and to be better. These kinds of direct challenges, whether they come from dads, pastors, authors, coaches, or drill sergeants, can be immensely valuable. Sometimes they're the only thing that can reach a man's heart. When you can understand this reality, you can see Driscoll's appeal. His ministry did change lives. Others like him before and since have changed lives. And when you change a man's life, you inspire fierce devotion. But pastors and leaders must handle that devotion with great care. When countering a culture that often attacks traditional masculine inclinations as as inherent vice, the answer isn't to indulge traditional masculine inclinations as inherent virtue. It's a good line. In fact, our efforts to to define what it means to be a Christian man, we shouldn't center our efforts on masculinity at all, but rather on understanding a person, a person who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. Now, the conclusion of this article places French as deeply evangelical, and Part of why I haven't put out more videos yet about the rise and fall of Mars Hill is because it is so quintessentially evangelical. And some of you, especially if you read, oh, where's that book? Something like Jesus and John Wayne, you would say, oh yeah, evangelicalism is deeply masculine. That's not what I'm saying at all. Mars Hill, Driscoll, were deeply evangelical. In fact, probably the sin that Driscoll committed, which is being called out by Christianity today, is that, in fact, Driscoll was wandering over the line between evangelical and fundamentalist. Those are the sins he's called out on. Now, in the podcast, they do a lot of calling out on the sins of pragmatism and evangelicalism. But as we'll see in in Worthen's book, The Apostles of Reason, in many ways, that's precisely what evangelicalism is. It's not a church. It's a market movement. It always has been. And 
I don't say that to denounce it or decry it, but that's simply what it has been. One of the things, so many of you notice, I have a variety of things on the internet. One of the things that I have, which almost no one pays any attention to, which is probably a good thing, is my blog. It's either, you can find it at paulvanderclay.me or you can find it at leadingchurch.com. Um, it's basically my filing cabinet, and I've been noting what I, like I often do, I, I put lists of articles that I find so I can find them easily. And when I was still on vacation, when I started listening to the podcast, I did a little bit of Google searching and found pastors and people who were paying attention to this podcast and their commentaries on it. Now, there's supposed to be 12 episodes of this plus some bonus episodes and so we're not even halfway through yet the episode that dropped that I haven't listened to was on Josh Harris there's going to be a lot to talk about with this but we need to have a deeper historical context I think to do what the podcast says it wants to do but what I'm not secure I'm not I'm not convinced it's doing very well just today, in fact, Tripp on Twitter posted this piece, The Unintended Consequences of Failure Porn. Um, I thought this was by Liam Thatcher. I th thought this was a particularly good critique of the podcast. But it's, it's a little difficult to critique the podcast when you're only really five episodes in. So we'll take our time with it and uh, we'll, see, we'll see where the conversation goes. Now, now, David French is, the reason I say he's extremely evangelical in his critique is by virtue of what evangelicalism has been right from the beginning. Now, he's sort of slicing the onion between progressive evangelicalism and increasing cultural resistance to evangelicals. Um, David French has become a favorite conversation on CRC Voices. And um, some of my friends on CRC Voices uh, post his pieces fairly regularly. He, in many ways, I think, is sort of staking out similar ground to what Christianity today tried to stake out in the 1950s and the 1960s. He, he's, he seems very much honing for that place because on one hand, He's a nice guy from the PCA, and based on this article, he seems to have been a veteran. Uh, based on other car articles that I've read about his on race, he's, he's adopted children from other ethnic groups. Um, he actually attends the church of a friend of mine, who um, his name has come up in my private conversations with that friend. And so, you know, he seems like a, a really nice guy. But I think for a lot of conservatives, especially conservatives that are a little bit more ideological and a little bit more political, I'm going to use this term because uh, many wokesters have brought this term back into fashion in a new sanitized form. In, in a sense, he's sort of a house Negro of white conservatism, and I think a lot of people see him that way. Um, I don't really have a lot of opinions on David French, but the fact that he's a member of the PCA, which really sort of places him right at that edge where Christianity today was in the 50s and 60s, and I think as this podcast unfolds, we're going to get a sense of where Christianity today is. Now remember... Um, Christianity Today has been through a couple of editors. Their previous galley, Mark Galley, whose, whose work I really enjoyed, I subscribe to Christianity Today partly so I have access to their archives. Mark Galley um, was a fan of Jordan Peterson, and he wrote about Jordan Peterson fairly regularly in his edit, or a few, at least a few times in his editorials. Mark Galley also quite famously, upon retiring from the editorship of Christianity today joined the Roman Catholic Church. That was interesting. And, you know, he wrote stuff about it and tried to say things about it, but the fact that he did it was enormously interesting because 
one of the issues that comes up in Molly Wortham's book is, at least in the 50s and 60s, part of what Christianity today keeps trying to do is have the big Christian conservative tent and hold it together. And and at that point, especially, you had some pretty ardent anti-Roman Catholics still in the evangelical community. The um, When finally, after the Catholics, evangelicals began to be known for their opposition to legalized abortion in the United States, that's really part of the thing that merged, began to merge the healing between Roman Catholics, conservative Roman Catholics, and evangelicals. But in, in some ways, what we're going to have to look at as we look at Mark Dristol and as we look at Molly, Molly Wortham's book and as we continue to keep in mind George Marsden's book, Fundamentalism in American Culture, is going to be, well, how have things moved? Now, again, in my summer break, I visited Yellowstone and I didn't spend enough time in Yellowstone, really. Yellowstone is an enormous park with a ton of things to see, but it was... It was sort of in the path on our way between Tetons and Glacier. And unhappily, there was too much smoke in the air to really enjoy Glacier National Park as it should be enjoyed. And we couldn't even go into the Canadian part of it, which kind of bummed me out. But Yellowstone is, of course, on this hot spot. And, and before we did Yellowstone and before we did Tetons, my wife and I did um, Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho. It's a, it's a little, it's not a big park. It wasn't crowded, which was delightful. But like many very interesting places in the West, it was volcanic. And, and part of what's interesting is that this hot spot that is currently under Yellowstone, this super volcano, um, has sort of migrated through. And, and perhaps what we're seeing is, well, David French is sort of right on the Christianity Today 1950-1960 hotspot. But the question is, where is Christianity Today now? And actually that has everything to do with the history of, with the ongoing history, the split after the Civil War, the rise of fundamentalism, the coming of the Cold War, the rise of the religious right in the 1980s, and then the seeker movement in the church, and then the emergent movement, which really splits into like these, these two twin towers of the emergent movement, where you have the young, restless, and reform, which is Driscoll, at least for a while, and then Rob Bell. But what they both have in common in many ways, both in many ways deeply enmeshed in the megachurch movement, are, are, are some real commonalities. Now, of course, Rob Bell keeps going into the spiritual direction and is on Oprah and all of these things and continues to do his videos. He doesn't seem to be anywhere near sort of the cutting edge that he was. And then you've got Mark Driscoll, who, and, and again, I, I, I've really appreciated the podcast so far. Why is this podcast making waves? This is, well, in my last video, I talked about vision and culture. And I talked a little bit again about Brett Weinstein and, and human beings having two tracks. Cultures cohere around implicit, around an implicit vision of values, right and wrong. And we see that in these long-standing culture wars in America and in American church history. We all have a value hierarchy, but these value hierarchies necessarily include and exclude around values and enforced norms. And when I say enforced norms, it's sort of like Jordan Peterson's enforced monogamy. Now, what's interesting about enforced monogamy is while everybody took offense to when Jordan Peterson uttered the phrase, if you watch, like I've, you know, if you watch the, all, the whole suite of Bachelor, Bachelorette programming that ABC is making lots of money on, you'll find enforced monogamy all over the place. 
You might not need to be married to have sex. You might not even care what sex the people are if they're hooking up or making out or getting married. But monogamy, at least for certain groups of people, continues to be enforced, not by the government, but implicitly by each other. That's in the culture. And, and these mappings determine status, participation, and really map the social landscape. And as we take a look at the anxiety around Mark Driscoll, the worry around his practice, and what I really appreciated by Liam Thatcher's, the, you know, what seems to be on the horizon is increased use of therapeutic language to either include or exclude on the church scene. Now, again, because some of you are going to listen to this and say, well, well, we're expecting you to right out of the gate say certain things about Mark Driscoll or certain things about Jordan Peterson, to use certain code words that identify you on the right side of history or the wrong side of history, to take certain stands. There's that implicit landscape. And, and often we sort of make it explicit bit by bit by bit. And, well, people aren't quite sure they like when you do that. Because when you start bringing these things to the surface and putting them out there in the surface, uncomfortable questions arise, such as uh, enforced monogamy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People are enforcing monogamy all over the place. Did you cheat on me? How dare you cheat it on me? What exactly is cheating? Oh, monogamy is deeply enforced by our culture. Almost everything else can go, but don't you cheat. Uh. Now, this podcast is attempting to update the conservative American Protestant story for the last 50 years. Now, when I was listening to this podcast on vacation, a lot of the stuff in it, a lot of the ambiguities in it that Liam Thatcher really brought out nicely. So we'll we'll return to that um, that blog post likely, and I'll put I'll put the David French um, link to the David French piece in my notes. I'll put the link to my list of links in the notes. And if I if I don't put any of these things in the notes, if I forget, for example, because I'm making this on Friday and I'll post it on Monday, which means somehow I'll. I'll finish out all the details during the week. If I forget something, just put a comment and, and I'll, I'll, try and, um, I'll try and update the notes. Now, I'm old enough, and I, and I realize I've, I've used this metaphor for to a number of people, and I realize that because I was born in the 60s, and because I remember the fall of the Soviet Union, by the way, the rest is history, uh, their episode on the Berlin Wall I thought was great. The only problem with the rest is history is it makes me want to buy more books, which is exactly, in some ways, what the, all these things are designed to do. Christianity Today telling this story is sort of like, Gor like Gorbachev telling the story of the Soviet Union. Now, why do I say it that way? Who was Gorbachev? Some of you don't even know. Gorbachev was the last leader of the Soviet Union, and he basically gave it up. He was the one who decided, we're not going to roll tanks in to keep the satellite states in Eastern Europe from breaking free of their bonds and deciding their own course instead of, seeing, instead of being clients of the Soviet Union. Christianity Today telling this story is like Gorbachev telling the story of the Soviet Union. So Mark Galley retires from the editorship of Christianity Today, joins the Roman Catholic Church. Someone who's very well versed in Jordan Peterson stuff. Neo-sacramentalism. Fascinating. Um, Daryl... I want to say Daryl Hannah, but that's the actress. Um, Danny Harrell, that's what I'm thinking of. Danny Harrell was, for a time, second staff at um, Park Street Congregational 
um, my brother-in-law and my deceased sister's congregation in Boston. He had the evening service. It was much more of the youth service. Um, interesting guy, great speaker, briefly editor at Christianity Today. I don't know what happened. He suddenly disappeared, and now Timothy Dalrymple, who I haven't done any research on, but he's one of these guys that has been around Christianity Today for a long time. Now, of course, Christianity Today is located currently in Carroll Stream, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Christianity Today, when it was founded by Carl F. Henry, was officed originally in Washington, D.C. That move is also not incidental. I met Carl F. Henry once. He was coming to Calvin Seminary for some lectures, and he was staying probably in the manor house that used to be sort of the guest house at Calvin College back in the 80s. Uh, they eventually turned Decima's residence up on the north end into the guest house and the manor house. Uh, Galen Biker, who uh, became famous for his own reasons as president of Calvin Seminary, uh, began to live in the manor house, this beautiful home which had been the, the manor house for the Knollcrest Farm. Calvin College had been on Franklin Street in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and in the 1960s moved out from Franklin Street during the suburbanization of Grand Rapids. There's a lot of history in there in the CRC. Goes to the Knollcrest campus. So Carl F. Henry was likely staying in the manor house, and on a Sunday morning, I was a security guard, and I had been up late that night, but I'm a regular breakfast eater. And so I'd go to the dining hall. It was a weekend, I know, because I was eating in the commons and not in the Knollcrest dining hall. You Calvin grads will know of what I speak. And I go into the dining hall early for breakfast because I ate breakfast every day. I love breakfast. I went in there to eat breakfast, and I see this old man sitting all by himself at a table in the corner. And I felt sorry for the guy. So I thought, well, I'll go sit with him. And I'll, you know, I've always, I've liked talking to randos. So I went and sat with him and introduced myself. And at that point, I think I was in my fifth year. I was planning on at that. It had to be late in the year because by that point, I knew I was going to Calvin Seminary and not to Fuller, which was my original plan. I think I've probably told the story other places. And the guy introduces himself as Carl Henry. <sighs> I didn't know what that meant. But I just remembered who he was, and we talked a little bit, and I said I was going to Calvin Seminary, and he said, oh, that's a good seminary to go to. You'll, you'll, get, a, you'll get a traditional Reformed theological education at Calvin Seminary, which indeed I did. That was before they restructured the curriculum because um, accrediting came in and told them it was too tyrannical. You were squeezing the life out of your seminarians by, with the amount of work that you mandated. That's another story, but... Molly Worthen's book, Apostles of Reason, has a lot of interesting stuff about Carl Henry and the way that Christianity today formed. And that stuff is deeply at the heart of evangelicalism and why it's grown. And that this podcast, this isn't just some rando, Mike Cosper, just being Mike Cosper like Paul Vanderclay, being a pastor of some local church and starting a YouTube channel just because... Jordan Peterson and his following gives him some ideas, so just for poops and giggles doing this stuff, Mike Cosper's working for Christianity Today, and when you listen to the podcast, the little advertising, the slick music, it's like, oh, this is deeply evangelical. But where is evangelicalism going? And why Mark Driscoll? Oh, there's a lot here. American Civil War was foundational in setting up the American Protestant landscape we are all living through today. I, I liked in The Rest is History on the Enlightenment, if you've listened to the whole thing. I mean, you really can't conceive of the United States without the Enlightenment, and, and you can't conceive of it without the Protestant Reformation. You know, the Anglicans down south and the Puritans up north and... You know, the Catholics don't really come onto the scene until the middle of the 19th century. And, and then, as I've said before, at the end of the Civil War, 
the northern churches win and the fundamentalism that gets occupied that occupies the southern churches as Marsden quite significantly shows is a northern is is very make very much a northern transplant and that church splits over the modernist fundamentalist issues so the American Civil War was a found it was foundational for setting up the American Protestant landscape we are all living through today. America and Protestantism are deeply, deeply connected. American Protestantism has been foundational for American imperial culture, as has, of course, English history, which makes Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook's podcast so interesting for me because, especially their their podcast on Americanization. It's just always going back and forth. America the colony, but sometimes America the colony shoots ahead and England is the follower and back and forth we go between these two nations. Now, Tripp almost immediately when I posted something on Twitter said, I want to have a conversation with you about this. Okay, Tripp. That sounds like fun. Tripp lives in Seattle, and uh, Tripp's got some personal history and some stories to share, so hopefully we can make that happen. But the thing that he wrote me on Twitter, which I found right on about the podcast, it's both very good and very bad. And so today when he posted to me that that article from, Lee Th- from Liam Thatcher, I thought, yeah, that's a lot of my thoughts. And the ambiguities are, are not just, see, history is always a funny thing to tell. When I was in the Dominican Republic, came there right out of, right out of seminary, and you can put that on the, the bingo card. Patterson's coming up next, so there'll be a lot of bingos in this video. One of the missionaries had decided to the 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 work of the Christian Reformed Church in the Dominican Republic was about 12, 13 years old when I got there. I decided to write a history of the field. The other missionaries didn't enjoy the history. Why? History writing is always a fascinating thing because, as I mentioned, as I was reflecting when I was reading Dynasty on my vacation, there's all this relevance realization. And so... History writers are always, in a sense, appropriating the past for the questions we have today. And this particular missionary in the Dominican Republic was the most conservative of the missionaries. He didn't believe that women should be clergy and anything like that. And he eventually left the Christian Reformed Church for a more conservative denomination. And not everybody appreciated the history that he wrote. That is very true of the rise and fall of Mars Hill. This is a history that is very much being told with the eyes and the judgments of today. And I was very much a part of the church planting movements of the early aughts. That's when I came to Sacramento in 1997. We immediately jumped onto the church planting bandwagon. I took junkets to Willow Creek junkets to Saddleback. I remember reading Eugene Peterson while visiting Saddleback. It was it was quite a it was quite a contrast between the two perspectives. What are we going to make of Mark Driscoll? Before there was Jordan Peterson, there was Mark Driscoll. And the stories and the personalities and the idiosyncrasies and the strengths and the weaknesses of both men very much come through. Now, anyone who's a pastor knows that, especially of a church plant. Because if you're in a church a long time, there are aspects of the church, especially if you're the church planter, that, that will mirror the life of the founder. So this podcast, it's being told from a place that Tripp and many of you will find deeply troubling. But you'll have difficulty putting your finger on it. So we're going to peel up the layers, try and put our fingers on some things. What's behind the rise of neo-evangelicalism 
That's the term that they themselves used. Um, Carl Henry, um, a whole bunch of people that we'll meet in this book, Billy Graham, for what they talked about their movement. Evangelical was what the Europeans called Protestants. And the relationship with neo-Orthodoxy is what, as it was called, Karl Barth, who we've met in this podcast just briefly, um, very much comes into play. The rise and fall of Mars Hill is heavily produced by Christianity Today. I remember when I first started my YouTube channel, people were like, well, what you need to do is you need to have like this intro because the way you do a YouTube channel is you have this little teaser, then you have the intro, da, 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 da. you know, Jonathan Peugeot's little intro, this is the symbolic world. And then you have the meat of the podcast. And the only intro you get is, hi, this is Paul. That's about it. And part of that's because I can't be bothered to make an intro. I don't know if I'd be happy with it. You really kind of have to be a designer or an artist to do that, and that's not my thing. But another part of me is like, every time I start a video, there's a teaser. I'm kind of curious about the teaser. And then there's the intro, you know, that little forward button that you can go five seconds in YouTube. It's like, Jonathan Peugeot's intro is 20 seconds long. One, two, three, four. Get to the stuff. I'm not here to listen to the pretty music I've listened to a thousand times. Same with Jordan Peterson's Mozart intro. Again and again and again when I listen to the Mars Hill thing, it's so slick. Won't you join the growing community, the growing movement? It's a movement. I remember another a colleague of mine sitting down with two fresh-faced church planters and the church planters telling us we think we think we're starting a movement not a church and my colleague said does your movement have a budget <laughs> We're all older men now and we laugh at that at that moment Christianity Today is the flagship periodical behind the movement and deeply tied to the issues that, oh, I need an acronym, the rise and fall of Mars Hill. Well, I didn't get the acronym right. Mars Hill is attempting to process and implicitly evangelize us with. Because we're all doing it. I mean, I'm always trying to evangelize you. I try and be sneaky about it, try and put it down underneath, trying to put a good face on Christianity. Guilty as charged, but how do you do it? And what tools do you use? And what do you demand? And what values in the culture are enforced? And what can you kind of peel up and see, oh, there's your value. Let me assure you that this is not a fundamentalist magazine, wrote CT associate editor J. Marcellus Kick. In a potential to a potential contributor shortly before the magazine's maiden issue in 1956. We do believe in the plenary inspiration of scripture. He didn't say inerrancy. And if you begin reading the book early, you'll see what's with that word inerrancy. The plenary inspiration of scripture. And we'll do our best to show that this scriptural doctrine, that this is scriptural do doctrine. We feel that there is a drift to the right theologically, and we certainly would like to give it some guidance, lest it become fundamentalist in character. In most of their publications and correspondence, the CT editors, editors preferred to call themselves evangelical, a label untainted by the ghost of the Scopes trial and the ugly church schisms in the early part of the 20th century. What things are Christianity today now backing away from? Dread Christian nationalism, the patriarchy, white supremacy, all of the things that... Hmm. When Bart, Karl Bart, published his American lectures as evangelical theology in 1962, remember, he's using that word in the European sense, not in the American sense. Carl Henry wrote that C.T. was all the more responsible in the months ahead to sharply define the content and the meaning of the term evangelical. Now, what's interesting is that this book opens with Carl Henry at a lecture in 
the United States where the already aged Karl Barth had come here and Molly Worthen tells the story, basically Carl Henry and Carl Bart going toe to toe about all of the kinds of issues that the fundamentals and the modernist fundamentalist fight were anxious about. And Carl Bart pretty reliably staying over on the modernist side, although again, neo-orthodoxy trying to find Jesus after he's been demythologized. And Carl Henry not having it. The editors had not come to bury fundamentalism, but to rehabilitate it. Hmm. One of the things that I think is bothering some of you about the rise and fall of Mars Hill is that there's a really subtle rehabilitation process underway. And that rehabilitation process is sort of, well, the way a lot of churches are going, a lot of denominations are going. And, you know, you can think what you want about it, um, but everybody's got an agenda and agendas sneak through. And the evangelical way is to show yourself as relevant and kind of like David French does there, sneak in, sneak in the little altar call right at the end of it. But is that going away? Am I a fundamentalist? Some of you think so. <laughs> Some of you wish I were far more one. The editors had not come to bury fundamentalism, but to rehabilitate it. Bell was not afraid to use the word in order to win over the pastor of a Bible Baptist church in Kansas. Let me assure you that Christianity today assumes the complete doctrinal position of fundamentalism, he wrote. Our deviation from that position has to do with the method of preaching the gospel. Look at Willow Creek Church. That comes up a lot in the Mars Hill podcast. Look at Willow Creek Church. Willow Creek didn't want to really change evangelical gospel, but wanted a, which sounds so interesting now, a safe space to hear a dangerous message. So we're going to take down the crosses. We're going to have kind of jazz music like you might hear in a club or probably more so an elevator. And we're going to Jacob asked me in the Q&A today, when am I going to wear? start wearing a collar? Ooh, that's a very insightful question, Jacob. It's a very insightful question. But Willow Creek, that was, that's what it was about. Keep the, You have the four spiritual laws. You have the Roman road. You have evangelism explosion. And Willow Creek was quintessentially, it was at that point in terms of the this hot spot and the, the plate tectonics above it, Willow Creek was right at that spot in the 80s and 90s. Now Driscoll's going to follow from there. From our, de our deviation from that position has to do with the method of preaching the gospel. With all our hearts, we believe in separating, um, in separation from the world and from apostasy. However, men who truly believe Jesus Christ to be the Son of God and their Savior from sin are not apostates, although they may be weak in the faith or lacking in the knowledge of the word. Okay. So your enforcement goes to get to be as small as possible. Why? So your market can be as broad as possible. Why? For the politics? That's some of it. Bell, a worldly wise missionary and veteran of decades of Presbyterian squabbling, was at heart a pragmatist who believed that his son-in-law's cooperation with liberals, modernists, and Catholics was a reasonable price to pay for packing more warm bodies into the crusade venue every night. Now, when you listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, watch how many times they say, is this about the numbers? There's sort of a mainline evangelical line in there because sort of what's happening is it's not about popularity, it's about justice. But justice is about numbers too as it gets negotiated now. Numbers of arrests, numbers of incarcerations, numbers of... 
household income, numbers, numbers, numbers. And the question is, relevance, realization, which group of numbers are really the ones to watch? The ones in the seats of churches? Well, I'll tell you, the politicians, Carl Rowe, for example, in the George W. Bush campaign, looked at the numbers. Politicians continue to look at the numbers. What does Richard, what does, um, what does Richard Dawkins care about? i to keep all my horsemen straight. They care about the politics of it. We don't care if fundamentalists believe whatever the heck they believe. We just don't want them voting. Hmm. A quarter century of missions in China had taught him the value of earning the trust of all members of a local community before beginning evangelistic work. Smart man. However, separatists, accusations that Graham and Christianity today departed from the old-time orthodoxy got his goat. I am a thoroughgoing evangelical and fundamentalist in the old sense of the word, but I am sick and tired of the type of fundamentalism which is characterized by divisiveness and a spirit far removed from that of Christianity. Bell wrote in a letter to the Greenville News, the hometown paper of one of the neo-evangelicals' fiercest critics, Bob Jones. Interesting. A circuit preacher from the age of 15 with eyes like wet stones. That's interesting. It's good writing. And a crowd-carrying voice had made him one of the most famous evangelists in the country. Jones had left full-time evangelism in 1927 to found Bob Jones College with 85 students. The school had become a university when it moved to Greenville, South Carolina in 1947, boasting an enrollment of nearly 2,500. Dr. Bob, an honorary title that simultaneously aped and mocked the academy, represented the neo-evangelicals' heir of erudition, but shared their fear of civilization's collapse. He believed that cooperating with non-evangelicals, as Billy Graham did, would hasten the, demi hasten the demise of the Christian West. Before there was Jordan Peterson, there was Mark Driscoll. Chris Driscoll is concerned about the fall of the church. Jordan Peterson is concerned about the fall of the West. If I were not able to take a position against the ecumenical sponsorship Billy Graham has in New York, I would be repudiating the position I have always held, Jones wrote to Bell in 1957. It is the position primarily held by evangelists Billy Sunday, Reuben Torrey, Morris Chapman, and I knew all of them and worked with all of them. I know how they stood. Jones brought his vision of fundamentalist separatism to life in the campus of his university. When Nelson Bell mailed a letter defending Billy Graham to every BJU student address he could obtain, he, provided a flood, he provoked a flood of supportive and sometimes fearful replies. A few wrote to describe their interrogation and verbal abuse by Dr. Bob before he expelled them from the school for supporting Billy Graham. It's quite a fight, huh? His minions opened their mail to monitor their correspondence. They feared that if they ra tried to raise questions with their teachers in private, their comments would be recorded and used against them. Two parents from a distance came by to see me after visiting the university and told me that the spying, fear, repression, and mental and spiritual regimentation of their children was something they thought only existed in Soviet Russia. Bell wrote to BJU trustee. One distressed student sent Bell a copy of a plea he had mailed to his classmate at the height of the controversy. They are brainwashed. They are, we are being brainwashed, and you know it. We cannot think our own thoughts or make our own decisions. We cannot even pray for a Christian leader like Billy Graham, whom God is using so much. Well, what does that mean? God is using so much. This is not to say that Bob Jones did not have his own blueprint for cultural renewal. Totalitarians, or would-be totalitarians, always do. Ooh. 
He would he when he founded the college, Jones envisioned a great liberal arts institution that would overturn the popular stereotype of fundamentalists as yokels with greasy noses, dirty fingernails, baggy pants, and who never shined their shoes. So in some ways, Christianity Today and Bob Jones are fighting the same fight. His mother-in-law, Estelle Stolowork, was a matriarch of a prominent Alabama family who tutored BJU students in high culture and etiquette and helped found the BJU Opera Association. Bob Jones Jr., the evangelist son, was a fanatic for Shakespeare and Renaissance art. He founded a successful undergraduate Shakespeare company and assigned himself a top role in almost every play the school puts on, reported The Nation. As a dying leer, he can mutter a credible, pray you, undo this button. Jones Jr. toured Europe each summer with an allowance from the Board of Trustees to purchase fine works by Renaissance and Baroque masters for the university's growing collection. Fine art proved compatible with BJU's fundamentalism as long as it remained a foreign language. One had to master rather than a stimulus for free thought. In the minds of the Joneses, art like history was a narrative to be preserved, not reinterpreted, a source of authority, not provocation. Bell, too, invoked the blessings of Dwight Moody, Billy Sunday, and other great revivalists of previous generations. He insisted in letters to Jones and others that Graham police with um, police. Um, Policy with reference to cooperation and support of his meetings is identical with the, po the policy followed by the fundamentalist preachers of yore. Bell was largely correct. These evangelists, placed, these evangelists placed far more emphasis on saving souls than enforcing theological boundaries. Charles Finney warned against the sectarian spirit and the jangling and strife of words that might interfere with the saving the lost and chastised clergy who have exalted their peculiar views and their own estimation into fundamental doctrines and contend for them with as much pernacity and vehemence as if all must be reprobate as if all must be reprobates who do not embrace them. Billy Sunday welcomed the support of Catholics at his revivals. Billy Sunday was early. However, the scale and meticulous organization of Billy Graham's crusades were unprecedented, and he called on local pastors who sponsored him to give more than a mere to give more than their mere assistance. Some served on the crusades executive committee and lent their churches resources and parishioners to meet Graham's staffing and organizational needs. Close cooperation that outraged fundamentalists. So you see the tension in there. And it's very interesting what Christianity Day was trying to do. This is from a little earlier in the book. Highbrow fundamentalism. In the late 1955, desperately working to recruit contributors to Christianity Today, Nelson Bell told one graduate that the editors intended to send the magazine free to every Protestant minister in America, Canada, and Great Britain for the first year, a total of nearly 200,000 readers at a minimum. Expanded in the magazine's second year to include Unitarians and Universalists, they mailed outstanding excerpts of each issue to 600 secular newspapers and one copy to every columnist in Washington, D.C., where Christianity Today was headquartered in order to be close to the pulse of national politics. The editors reviewed readers' feedback at each board meeting, responded to nearly all letters, and maintained a scrapbook of references to Christianity Today in the secular press. Carl Henry, CT's first editor-in-chief, though the masthead, much to his irritation, called him merely editor, did not hide his grand vision under a bushel. He had long believed that serving Christ required both savvy marketing and sophisticated thinking. The rise and fall of Mars Hills drips with those aspirations, like the dripping forests of Saxony. He had followed his Ph.D. thesis on church publicity with a Ph.D. in theology at Boston University and the magazine provided the perfect platform for both. 
He declared Christianity today to be the culmination of the neo-evangelical effort to reinvent the reputation of orthodox Protestantism. That's orthodox with a small o, just in case you're not reading along. In 1957, in May 1957, he tried to alert his colleagues to the opportunity at hand. In a sense, all that has gone before is a discrete preliminary operation aimed to secure for the magazine the theological respect and intellectual dignity necessary for effective conversation with liberal and neo-Orthodox ministers. Our contributing editors indicate that now is the time to become theologically and ecclesiastically more aggressive. The editors plan to rehabilitate conservative Protestantism's reputation. Again, if you read Marsden's book, you see this all in the light of a huge trajectory that begins really with the end of the Civil War. Contributing edgers, ed editors included Billy Graham and Edward L. R. Elston, um, Eisenhower's pastor. An ad campaign in the pages of U.S. News and World Report assured leaders in business and politics that Christian faith was crucial to the democratic capitalist way of life. It was, neither, it was never intended that God be ignored from the business scene any more than he be excluded with impunity in world affairs. Necessary as business and trade journals are, a business leader also needs the help and insight he can receive from Christianity Today, a magazine with a worldview approach to today's problems and pressures. The ad decries the false notion of peace advocated by the Soviets and lamented the socialist specter of labor unions at home. They were not just political perils, but spiritual dangers, signs of a civilization drifting from its Christian moorings. The editors aspired to win readers outside the United States as well. Henry wanted a voice in the theological debates underway in Europe. No one report to the board, um, in one report to the board, he argued that the dominance of neo-Orthodox theologians, Karl Barth and Emil Bruner, had subsided. The liberal theology of Rudolf Bultmann, who was determined to demythologize the Bible and reinterpret its supernaturalism in existential terms, was on the ascent. This moment of instability opened the way for Christianity today to enter the fray. Henry recommended that the magazine open bureaus in London and Geneva and publish a German edition. Henry's German roots probably sharpened his desire to enter intellectual debates there. Such a transition time in theological leadership takes place only once in a generation and creates a strategic moment for us, he wrote. We have a golden opportunity to step into the situation influentially on the evangelical side. By the most basic measure, Henry and his colleagues succeeded. People read the magazine. Six years after its founding, 140,000 pastors received the magazine free. Only 38,000 paid for it. That number seems small when compared to the, circular, uh, the circulation of popular magazines like Time, which claimed 2.5 million readers in 1960. Yet alongside peer publications, Christianity Today was doing well, which figures topping those of its venerable mainstay analog, Christian Century, whose circulation hovered around 37,000, and besting National Review, 30,000 in 1960, although National Review's numbers were climbing. An independent poll in 1958 determined that Christianity Today was the most widely and most completely and most regularly read Protestant magazine, Henry bragged in his autobiography. The magazine attracted notice beyond conservative Protestant circles. Despite the myth that mainstream journalists only discovered evangelicalism with the rise of Jimmy Carter, the editors of Time had an abiding interest in evangelicals through, through the 1960s. They called Christianity Today a magazine of evangelical Christianity that tries to make traditional Protestant theology clear and interesting and nearly always succeeds, a kind of literate, highbrow fundamentalism. CT editors, editors must have blushed. From the secular media's perspective, they were the first highbrow fundamentalists since J. Gresham Machen.
Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, the magazine's combination of self-promotion and accessible erudition persuaded secular journalists to pay a disproportionate amount of attention to Christianity today. They dubbed it the evangelical, the leading evangelical periodical and the, and the leading evangelical conservative Protestant magazine, despite the fact that other evangelical magazines boasted higher circulation figures. The non-denominational Christian Herald, edited by Daniel Poling, a gentle fundamentalist and Norman Peale's predecessor at New York's Marble Cathedral, that's our RCA, Reformed Church of America, church, claimed a circulation of 450,000 in 1964. Yet the Herald, like other evangelical magazines, deferred to the authority of Henry and his colleagues and often reprinted Christianity Today articles, one historian noted. History has, of course, moved on. Rod Dreher and his blog, very popular blog, a lot of you read it. What Rod Dreher got right about same-sex marriage and Christianity in America. I found Jordan Peterson by reading Rod Dreher's blog. I had always thought Dreher was a bit of an alarmist, and I still think that. Um, but I was my own sort of progressive evangelical in many ways, pro-women in office. Um, uh, <laughs> some of you know how I vote. But began, or <laughs> how do I vote? But began wondering about the language I heard arising in the Christian Reformed Church around same-sex marriage. And it wasn't, wasn't the attempts to, the attempts to sort of combine it with Christian theology, it was the kinds of new theology that seemed to be arising. In the, 19, in the, in the Christian Reformed Church on CRC Voices, we're kind of seeing if we can lay our hands on the text of this article. So if anybody out there has a copy of the banner um, November 3, 1980, when Andy Kivenhoven wrote, It's time to burn the wooden shoes. Scan it and send it to me. I want to read it. So does Pete Vanderbeek. So do a number of us. The banner says they don't have it. But in 1980, the banner was still the weekly publication of the Christian Reformed Church. Weekly. In other words, in many ways, this was sort of Christianity Today was sort of, well, that's out here. The, the Big Ten conservative Christian evangelical and the banner was for the Christian Reformed Church. And if you know anything about the Christian Reformed Church, what does it's time to burn the wooden shoes mean? Andy Kivenhoven, one of those Dutch immigrants who came to Canada after the Second World War still spoke with a Dutch brogue. Um, long list of Canadian immigrant editors of the banner in the latter part of the 20th century and even into the 21st. The current editor of the banner, now a much diminished magazine, one which you no longer have to pay to subscribe to, um, and monthly and increasingly online, is another Canadian editor. Well, it's time to burn this wooden shoes. What did that mean? Well, this Dutch, American, and Canadian denomination needs to put its Dutch roots behind it. Boy, this is complex stuff, as Pete just wrote something on, on CRC Voices about it today. And, of course, I grew up right sort of in the epicenter of this because... My father's church was an experiment, as was this congregation where I pastor now in the question. Can black folks and white folks worship together the same God? Can they be part of the church family together? This was our family, and Northside was a bold experiment. And can we be the body of Christ together, black and white? And the answer is yes. Northside is a, was a special, special place in its time. And it went a long ways from, talk about clerical collars. There you go, Jacob. There's my father wearing a clerical collar. Um, by the time, well, getting into the late 70s, 
The collar was there no more. The world was changing fast. What does it mean to be Christian Reformed in North America? CRC is still trying to figure that out. That, of course, along the backdrop of this article that I've talked about often, a terrific blog on, on Pathios, how the civil rights movement converted white liberal Protestants to secularism. All this existential panic about Christian nationalism is itself a mile marker in terms of identity and morality. How do the words American and Christian actually relate? Evangelicalism has been attempting to be a friendly, subversive movement for a very long time. And the question is just subversive and movement towards what? because cultures cohere around an implicit vision of values and right and wrong. And we might not even know what all those values are until we bump into things in our life and we have a certain response and we have a certain reaction and we do some theological reflection and we say, what's going on here? Why do I feel as I feel? What's really going on in these mappings that I have been, that I have been, building in myself now, even for decades. They have a value hierarchy for certain, but they necessarily include and exclude around values and enforce norms that determine status, participation, and map social landscape. So when Willow Creek decides they want to create a safe space for a dangerous message, what's going on? What's safe? Well, the method can change, but the heart remains the same. Can we always do that? Well, that's basically orthodoxy comes along and says, no, you can't. We keep the method the same. That's one end. The other end says, no. The principles are there and we're always updating them. John Strickland, who's an orthodox priest, is writing a four-part series on Christian history. And I had actually bought the first book a little while ago. And this is another one of the books that I was reading over my vacation. I didn't finish it. Actually, I started reading this, and it got to his description of Tiberius, which I knew was lifted pretty much from Suetonius. And I knew that Tom Holland has some ideas about exactly what Suetonius and Tacitus were doing with their histories. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll read Dynasty before I continue reading this. And so I read Dynasty, and then I, I've been continuing reading this. And, and these sections of it really struck me as interesting. These four sources of Christian subculture relate very broadly to four features of the church listed by Luke in his account of Pentecost. Having related the descent of the Holy Spirit and the immediate expansion of the church in that day, the evangelist made an important statement about the character of the church thereafter. They continued steadfastly in the, apostol in the apostles' doctrine and in the fellowship and in the breaking of the bread and in prayer. Author's translation. His statement deserves pause. Most English translations of it lack the definite also article the that appears in the original Greek before each of the four nouns. The omission is significant, as the de definite article used by the authors indicates that each element represents a definite experience. For example, there was a definite doctrine transmitted by the apostles, not a diverse intellectual deposit from which to draw. There was a definite fellowship or community among members of the church, not an incho inchoke, um association of individuals. There was a definite sacrament of this communion, the Eucharist breaking of bread of which non-members did not share. And finally, there was a definite body of prayers used by the church to worship her Lord, not a merely spontaneous or random approach to worship. And now you're starting to get a sense of Orthodoxy Protestantism, where, how do these two things line up? But these, often, but these often lost articles are not the only point of importance in Luke's description of nascent Christendom. Nascent Christendom, that's a very interesting phrase here. His prefatory words in the verses also provide insight into his character. They continued steadfastly. That is, from, one, from day one, the church never ceased living out the faith delivered to her by Christ and confirmed by the Holy Spirit. Now, the faith 
there means the practice. Protestants, the faith, well, what do Protestants mean by the faith? She remains steadfast in her adherence to that faith. See, I would assert that faith means practice there. She did not waver. She did not compromise. She kept his holy tradition changelessly and handed it on from one generation to the next. Did they keep using the same language? Did they keep using Greek? Is it important that they would? Northrop Fry begins his lectures on the Bible by noting, and I thought quite saliently, that the church read the Bible in translation. What does he mean by the Bible? Same thing that Christine Hayes means, the Old Testament. The church, the early church, read its Bible in translation. And if you closely follow New Testament citations from the Old Testament, well, it's quite a thing. Are they quoting the Hebrew? Are they quoting the Septuagint? Where are they beginning? Where are they ending? Why these particular word choices? Doing so ensured not only the continuity of faith, but the possibility of nurturing a culture with it. Early Christendom drew all of its strength from traditional Christianity. The faith delivered at Pentecost cannot be reduced to a set of principles or any kind of system. It's principles. Underneath that, whether John Strickland is thinking about that at the moment or not, is very much the evangelical Protestant impulse to say, what we derive from the Bible are principles and we apply them in the modern world in a particular way. That's a, this is a very big deal, and this is a deal that, that, that the Jewish community has been struggling with for many years. Here you have all of this law. How do you live out this law? Pay very careful attention comparing laws in Exodus and laws in Deuteronomy. Some of those things might be interesting. What's going on? And so then he goes through in his book, Doctrinal Integrity, um, and the other, the other four points that he, that he laid there. But when I read that principle, I thought, ah, this is, this is where the Orthodox and the Protestant conversation may really take place. Fundamentalism was a very counter-cultural movement. It said, the culture is wrong, we need to go back. Mark Driscoll was very much that way. Christianity Today and the neo-evangelicals thought, how can we make progress in this? And again, they didn't continue consider themselves any different Christians than the fundamentalists. They just wanted to sort of figure out how to create a fundamentalism that people could live with. It's very interesting stuff. So again, the rise and fall of Mars Hill. What vision is behind that? And again, the choice of Mark Driscoll is tremendously interesting because in many ways, we're going to continue to look at Driscoll and Bell in this. And um, Cosper did an interview with former Christianity Today editor Sky Jatani on Sky and uh, Evangelical Mainstay VeggieTales creator on their podcast. And Sky lightly said, I'd love to see some stuff about comparing Rob Bell and Mars Driscoll. Yeah, me too, Sky. Me too. Because... Right there is a really critical inflection point in what's going on. Before there was Jordan Peterson, there was Mark Driscoll and Rob Bell. Jordan Peterson was exiled from the Blue Church and became a powerful countercultural voice. And the considerable institutions of Blue Church moved swiftly to try to marginalize him, and in many ways were successful. And it, at least to a degree, was responsible, I think, for the decline of Jordan Peterson's health. He also bears some responsibility for that. Driscoll's cultural journey was more complex, especially when it comes to church. And I think the podcast nicely shows a lot of that complexity. Again, what 
What Tripp said about it, it's both very good and very bad. What Liam Thatcher talks about it in his blog post, what David French notes in it, well, French is, doesn't really delve into it very deeply. There's a lot in there that's worth hearing. But the thing itself bears some of its own examination, especially, again, if it was some rando pastor in a dying California church writing some blog post or doing a podcast, that would be one thing. But this is Christianity Today doing this podcast. That's saying something. Driscoll's story is a way to make the implicit explicit and map the landscape. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to spend some time with this thing. Cultures cohere around an implicit vision. And that vision can be mapped. And they necessarily include and exclude around values and enforced norms. In many ways, part of the rise and fall of Mars Hill there's a lot of enforcement going on in that thing. Very subtle, very gentle, but don't you want to be one of the cool kids, not one of the fundamentals? Well, don't you want to be a safe space? Well, Bill Hybels isn't going to, you know, if, if Bill Hybels, if there had not after Bill Hybels' ministry been any stories of sexual indiscretion or me tooism he was already known and sometimes joked about at willow creek for being for being for being a control freak bill hybels who grew up in the christian reformed church how bill hybels would make sure that all of the mics were wrapped in perfect perfect circles that the music was just so, that the people looked just right. This rise and fall of Mars Hill, just so, just right. We don't escape our culture very easily. Slick, polished. We're not greasy hands, bright nose poorly clothed, wear skinny jeans and wonderfully produced Rob Bell videos. So, this is what we're going to be talking about. Hope you enjoy it. Leave a comment.